We are Maria and Nicole. We're two secular homeschooling moms that have been been there, done done that. that. Welcome to episode 19, How to Decide High School Subjects. Today we're going to be talking about the subjects that your high schooler needs to take, what electives they're going to need to take, and what constitutes a high school credit. This is our second episode in our high school series, and if you haven't already checked it out, be sure to check on our website to listen to our first and also our trailer for this series. And as usual, we want to stress that our podcast is an inclusive space for your everyday parents that are looking for education options. We are not here to convince you to homeschool. Uh, We want to stress that you need to do what works for your child and for your family. Every family is different. Absolutely. And you know your children best. So uh, feel free to take what advice or information you get from here that works for you and chuck the rest. Good morning, Nicole. How's it going? Hey, it's going great. I saw you last night at Mom's Night. We had a Mom's little... Mom's Night out. You didn't have a glass of wine. I did because I bailed on my... 75 <laughs> my hard. My 75 hard. Ah. The big ice freeze kind of messed up my plans. but And so I'm like, oh, well, here, I'll let's celebrate with a glass of wine. I know. And then I had my water and everybody, everybody tried their drinks and was like, mmm. And I drank my water and I was like, mmm. The best tasting water <laughs> ever. It's fresh squeezed. <laughs> Oh, yeah. That that, was fun. At that restaurant. Yeah, it was a good time. It was nice to see everybody. And I love connecting with my mom friends. Absolutely. I love them so much. So we have some exciting news to share with all of our listeners. Well, the organizer of the Texas Homeschool Expo contacted us and asked us to speak at the conference. And guess what? We said yes. We're so excited. We are especially excited because it is one of the few inclusive homeschool conventions that are out there. Yeah, this inclusive event, it's not aligned with any religious, political, or government entity, and it's open to all homeschooling styles and philosophies. Years ago, I went to one of the really big conventions, and there were some resources that fit with my family, but honestly, I felt kind of like a fish out of water. I didn't really relate to most of the people there, especially the ones that were organizing it. Right. Is this where we drop a denim skirt reference? (laughs) (laughs) And if that's you and you like denim skirts, that's totally fine. Totally fine. (laughs) But I'm guessing that it's not you because you're listening to our podcast. Right. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. And, you know, there's a fantastic list of speakers who are going to be at this conference. Um, One of them is Julie Bogart. Ooh, fangirling. I know. Of course, Julie Bogart's the author of Brave Learner, which is a book that we often recommend as an invaluable resource and a must read in your homeschool. And she's also the author of the Brave Writer curriculum, uh, which is also something we recommend. But uh, Brave Learner is a book that we've recommended over and over again. I know I've read it several times. Oh, yeah, me too. And for those of you that are listening to this episode, you'll be happy to know that what we're going to be speaking about, the topic is going to be planning for high school. Yeah, the expo will be a two day event. It's June 9th and 10th at the Grapevine Convention Center here in Texas. And we're also going to have a booth there. So come visit us. (laughs) Uh, I still don't know what we're going to have at our booth, but and we've already recruited. (laughs) some of our homeschool success story uh, children to run it. So (laughs) right, my daughter said absolutely not. But my 15 year old will be there. And I think your kids will be there. Well, I just signed mine up. I didn't actually ask them if they would do it. But (laughs) he said, well, he said he'll do it. And he'll run the booth whenever we're doing our session. If I bring him coffee and donuts that morning. Easy. Yeah, that's an easy. Yes. (laughs) So well, I know something that we might be able to have available for people at our booth, and we're going to be creating things along the way. But we have been creating resources that are just for you. So I don't think our entire high school series will be ready by then. I mean, the whole idea is that it's going to be complete by the end of the year of 2023. But I'm getting really close to completing the middle school guide. And I just finished my book of centuries. And that will be ready soon. And we'll also have them available at the expo. And if you don't know what a book of centuries is, we kind of talked about it last week where we talked about our timelines, but a book of centuries is a portable timeline journal. And this is, this is going to be different than any one that you can find out there because it's going to be using the abbreviations BCE and CE for before common era and common era. And those are notations that are preferred by scientific and academic writings rather than using the BC or AD which are a little bit more commonly used in religious writing. 
I was always frustrated. It's really one reason I did an entire wall on my right. timeline is because when I looked at book of centuries that were available, they didn't really fit with what I wanted. So I was always frustrated whenever I was looking. So I ended up building my own, but I'm going to have one just for you. Yeah, because times are changing and that can be frustrating. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to that. Um, I've also been working on a preschool guide Yay! and this is kind of a spinoff from our preschooler episode six, which was really popular. And I feel like it's important to cover more ground with this topic. Um, it's such a fun age and I really want everybody to enjoy this stage and set their preschooler up for success. I, I can't wait to read it. You are such a guru when it comes to making Aww. a magical childhood for little ones. So I, I'm super excited about that. Um, and that's going to be a great resource for those that are just getting started with homeschooling. So, well, let's move on since we have so much to cover on today's episode. Yeah, welcome to the second episode in our high school series. Yeah, we know that the idea of homeschooling high school can seem daunting to some, but we are here to assure you that with a good plan in place, homeschooling high school can be a cinch. In our first high school series episode, we covered how to make a four-year plan and everything you need to know before you get started on your plan. Uh, graduation requirements, your state law requirements, and we covered a lot. So if you haven't listened to it, make sure you go back there and listen to it. And if you're brand new to the series, make sure you actually start with our trailer. And that's going to be a great jumping off point for those of you that are just starting. So don't worry, we got your back. Totally. I always say that I really thought it was easier to homeschool high school than uh, younger years was. Uh, you really become more of an administrator than a teacher, especially mm -hmm. if you're outsourcing some or all of your subjects. So along that line, what subjects does my high schooler need to take? Well, there are several ways that you can look at setting up your high school class plan. Most important, look at your state homeschooling requirements to see if you are bound to certain requirements and restrictions. We are in Texas and here where we are considered our own private school and we get to set our own graduation requirements. Uh, so if that is true for you too. So where do you start? Let's get started on that. Okay, so there's two things that you may want to consider. Number one, what are your state's public high school requirements for graduation? Uh, the average is between 21 and 26 credits, and this is often a great guideline of the minimum classes or credits that you might want to strive for, and you may want this to be your goal for a student who is not college-bound, say. Right. Remember, you don't have to meet these requirements. They're separate from your state's homeschool requirements, and you don't always need to adhere to those. However, being aware of them might be helpful, especially when applying to state universities. And as a matter of fact, most homeschoolers I know actually exceed well beyond the state requirements. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And if you're not in Texas, no problem. I created a resource that lists each state and their homeschool requirements. And that's going to be a link on this on the show notes on this website. So check yeah. that out. Yeah. So two, number two, if you're college bound, let's work backwards and look to see what some of the potential colleges your student may be interested in require for incoming applicants. You can find this information on college admission websites pretty easily. Uh, we suggested making a list of kind of both those class recommendations. Yeah. To start and then planning from there. Right. And I created a document that I'm going to have available for everyone uh, with that. And it's going to be an Excel spreadsheet. It's going to be filled in a little bit so you can just kind of see and use it as a guide. But put your own personal child's classes in there and go from there. And that's going to be free downloadable from our website. So check that out. Uh, another thing is that when researching admission requirements for colleges like required high school courses, your best resource is going to be the college's admissions websites or the college admissions advisors. Yeah, that's we, our job. <laughs> yeah, we mentioned that before in our trailer. We talked about, you know, don't be afraid to call them and yeah. talk to them. So that's what they're there for. Exactly. Other sources for college admissions information is going to be uh, Prep Scholar or CapEx. And a good basic list of core classes may include your four language arts. You got English one, two, three, and four. Um, you have regular, you have honors or advanced placement. Usually there's four credits. There's speech. You can use that as a half a credit or one credit. We did it in college as a dual credit class. Yeah, so we did that too. was an entire credit course mm -hmm. on the transcript. And a great experience. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. That was Riley's favorite professor of all time. I want to yeah. say it was me, but 
<laughs> no. Yeah, Jack got invited to like lead a conference like oh. at the at the university uh, or at the community college from one of those classes. It was oh, fun. that's awesome. Okay, so uh, another thing would be four credits of math. Um, that would be typically algebra one and above. And oftentimes with science, you have biology, chemistry, physics, and a science elective. Usually that would be like four credits with three labs. So yeah, the be... lab lab science portion of that is mm -hmm. important. Social studies, uh, that's going to be all of your histories, your U.S. history, world history, American government uh, is usually half credit. Economics is a half half credit. Social studies elective like geography, um, you usually want to do about four credits of those. Right, and so when you say American government half a credit and economics half a credit. Again, we use dual credit, so those both counted for an entire year. So that was one credit right. per each. So we were loaded up on those credits. Yeah, and here in Texas, too, if you want for your uh, dual credit students that are getting an associate's degree, they also included Texas government as a required course. It, it was for the associate's degree. Yeah, which... that was our one class that uh, they had difficulty transferring. Uh, it did eventually transfer, but everybody and like my kids are out of state. So their schools were like, well, what? It's funny, you know, a lot do of people this? do their state history for yeah. during middle school. Well, I opted out of that. I didn't see the importance of that. Maybe maybe you do. And that's fine. We all do it differently. But I did not see any reason to do Texas history. But she, had she to ended get up having anyway. to do it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, another uh, another couple credits here is a uh, world language two to three years in the same foreign language so two years of a foreign language or two credits is usually uh, the standard for high school graduation slash college admission right and then if you want to have a distinguished diploma then you would typically have a third credit for uh, foreign language and then something kind of cool that a lot of people like to do is do ASL yeah. for their foreign language and I've even heard of a lot of kids that do coding or programming for a for their language so you'd yeah. have to check to see yeah you definitely want to make transfer. sure that that is like a uh, <laughs> that that fits before you dedicate all that time to it but that those are some uh, interesting and unique ways to satisfy those requirements right and all of those credits that is just a suggestion again one of the huge benefits of homeschooling is that you're able to completely cater the education experience to your child you may be an unschooler and your transcript may end up looking completely different and that's okay. There are endless opportunities to how you may want to set this up for your student. And a lot of people, I mean, that even struggle with math. Sometimes they'll do cooking and basics of cooking and, and incorporate as much math to that real life skill for their math credit. So really you need to look at your child and see exactly what fits for them and for your family. And electives are going to comprise a uh, great bit on your transcript here, but uh, we're going to get into those later in the same episode. So uh, when it comes to choosing core curriculum, uh, years ago, there were relatively few options for homeschool curriculum, especially in high school. And that's not the case anymore. It, like we have so many options and it can be completely overwhelming to select the best right. fit for your student and family. Right. And some things that you may want to ask are, are your children college or career bound? What are their personalities like? And what are their interests and abilities? You're going to have to really think about your child and who they are whenever you're choosing curriculum. Yeah. And again, remember, like, it's okay to just kind of gently figure out, are they college or career bound? Nobody needs to know for sure. Right. <laughs> we talked about that in our last episode, too. And I see that a lot, like online. I might have said this last time, too. I'm always surprised with the people who are like, my eighth grader is not college bound. I'm like, your eighth grader doesn't know. Right. I think that was in our middle school. That was, was our it? middle school was it? Right. It, it comes up that often that I feel like I talk about it all the time. But anyway, when you are ready to research core curriculum, you need to keep a few things in mind. You want to keep the big picture sure you know, front and center, that right. four-year plan. You want to consider those state requirements and um, all the different things that you're kind of molding into that. You want to think about the parent time investment. Uh, some curriculum's just not going to work for parents who have to help their teens learn. Right. Some of these people that are at home and working from home, you know, they're limited on what they can do and what they can't do and how right. much time they can invest daily to a curriculum. So yeah. if it needs a lot of oversight, it might not be a good fit for you. Right. You got to be flexible. Um, you want to think about the student time investment. Um, is your teen involved in a lot of extracurriculars and sports and other activities that are bogging down your schedule? Uh, you might want to consider trimming some back or you want to choose a more flexible program. Right. Another thing you might want to think about is your financial investment. 
will you be able to use the curriculum for your consecutive children as they grow and get into the high school years? Right. Uh, another thing is saving money is you can also share with another family and teach together or in a co-op type situation and you can split the cost. Right. And then you want to think about your student's learning style. Remember, there's not one right way to homeschool high school and there's not one right kind of homeschool curriculum. Um, and beware of the folks who are saying you must use this curriculum Mm because it's the right way because sometimes they're just selling expensive curriculum Mm -hmm. that happens a lot and there's uh, you could really go broke there's some of this stuff is really expensive so you're going to have to like budget and think about that well don't forget to watch our budgets episodes as we kind of guide you on some of that and some Mm -hmm. savings on that Uh, and again we want to circle back to the basics of your worldview and your homeschool philosophy and what kind of materials you're looking for whether they be online, book-based, etc., before you choose a curricula. This narrows down your search immensely and things that may have changed since you first started your journey, or maybe you're brand new to homeschooling altogether. If so, you need to probably check out our episode four on homeschool styles and philosophies and have that handy. And we're going to link that in our show notes, but that is a great guide. And in there, you can even do like a little quiz and you know determine you know who your child is as a learner so and who your family is really right right so just a reminder that this is a weekly episode we drop one every thursday morning just for you and if you have any additional ideas or comments please come and comment on our facebook page on the episode thread or send us an email at info at btdthomeschool.com we'd really love to hear from you So the core classes seem pretty simple, but what electives should I choose? Right. Well, when it comes to electives, your imagination is all that limits you. Typically, there will be one to three elective courses in each year of high school, and too many electives can sometimes overshadow the core academic classes. So Mm -hmm. you, I mean, (laughs) right now, I admit, we, my son's in a lot of electives, and so I've dialed back the core this year, but I'm going to have to rethink that next year. So it's something to think about. Your students' electives should reflect who they are and what they are all about. This is one of those places where you can incorporate your students' talents, interests, and achieve that standout status. Electives can allow your student to explore career options. Yep, and it can call for authentic experiences. Your student can oversee their own education and incorporate many different ways of learning. And electives leave room for unconventional experiences like internships and more. Uh, They don't have to require like a ton of book work. Right. Elective courses require less work from your student than core academic classes. And while some electives fit within the core academic subjects of math, language arts, history, science, and foreign language, Others are not core subjects at all, like PE, like auto maintenance, theater, or cooking. Right, right. You will be able to find existing curricula for many of the elective courses that your student may want to take. However, you can easily design these courses yourself. This is one of the fun parts and the possibilities are endless. Yeah, there's so many options for electives. I mean, really, this can be an endless list. There are certain options that might be pretty standard, like PE and health and driver's ed or music art. But you can also look to electives as a way of fine tuning a student's specific interests or maximizing on a talent or specialty. So there's a ton. We're going to list like some elective options. Um, (laughs) Obviously, way too many for us to go on and on about. We'll be here all day. Right. We started to create this document and it got longer and longer and longer. And now it's this huge document and we're going to have it on our website and you can download it for free. And it has so many things you may have never even thought about. But we wanted to list a few on the podcast to kind of guide you on, you know, kind of making you think outside the box. Uh, One thing you could do is environmental science or other eco type classes like botany or survival skills. You could do strategies for academic success like study skills. These are sometimes required first classes for dual credit students. We also recommend jumping on some of these in middle school. They are great prep for high school skills. Yeah, so some other examples of elective options are sociology, psychology, world religions, uh, speech, debate, and other communications type classes. Mm -hmm. Like my son did a photography class that was actually uh, under the communications headline. Their uh, journalism, TV and film. All of these were favorite classes that my kids took and great uh, options as dual credit courses as well. Right, and going into the arts, music, band, music history, music theory, 
art history, art or intro to art. These are all great classes that can often be taken in person and in conjunction with a local resource or a museum or even a local group band, music or art studio, private lessons. There's so many possibilities with this. And me having a musician son, we probably explored all of these. <laughs> all kinds of those, exactly. Economics, personal finance, consumer math, um, or concepts and probability and statistics. These classes are great for a student who may be going more in depth with a math or social social science pathway, but it's not really enough for like a core class level course. Um, so these are great to be electives. Right. There are a ton of options for computer gaming and programming type classes. Uh, there's computer applications. There's the, you know, like C++ coding, intro to game design, esports. Even here at the local college in Dallas, they have an actual uh, game design certificate that you can get. Yeah. You, you pass that with your associates and you're certified to start doing game design, which, you yeah, know, there's it's more and more popular. The future. Esports, I'm seeing that like everywhere. Too. They have a like, major at UNT. We're right. Yes, yeah. they have esports. I thought, oh, my God, they have a whole section. Yeah, they have a we, you can look into their lounge over here at or UTD and it's really cool. Yeah, <laughs> really cool. Health and wellness are great elective categories. Uh, contemporary health, nutrition and diet, uh, foundations of personal wellness, uh, uh, like a lifetime fitness, healthy living, any of those kind of right. courses. Um, you know, I have a son that was a weightlifter, so he was interested in like personal training and those kind of classes. Like those can all end up being great electives. Right. These these get so much more extensive than the basic boring PE class. But, you yeah. know, you can always do that, like a basic all sports. And, of course, there's the sports options are endless, especially here in Texas, very sport-centric state. Uh, driver's ed would be a typical one that a lot of students take in high school. These are often easy additions that you are going to do anyway, may as well count them. So right. do it. And some colleges may want two fine art credits specifically, and some don't specify at all. So again, looking at what potential schools require or recommend can help you fine tune your list. Make sure to visit that college's website for all that detail information. Electives are also a great spot to start when exploring dual credit programs. These can be easier classes to start with and then knock out some of the college credits at the same time. Mm -hmm. I always like the art appreciation classes. Yeah, it's, a, it's yeah. a great first class to kind of get your feet wet. Right. And Kathy Lee's dual credit book, we have recommended that. We'll have it here in the show notes. And it specifically mentions starting with your humanities to kind of set your child up for success. It's a great jumping off point. Yeah. We will include some of the links and ideas and everything that we're talking about on our show notes on our website. So be sure to check that out after you listen. We would love it if you would take a second to go out there and like and rate us. Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio. We are on all those streaming platforms. So go out and check us out. Give us a thumbs up. So we've talked a lot about credit, but what actually constitutes a credit? Well, credits are a way of measuring a student's completion of the education requirements that you've set or that are required by your state homeschool laws, if you have any. Uh, most high school courses are going to be worth either one credit for a one-year course or a half credit for a semester course. And the credit assigned to each course generally takes into account course content, uh, instruction time, and the time the student spends completing coursework. Right. A textbook designed to be completed in one school year is typically given one credit, while a textbook meant to be completed in one semester is often given a half of a credit. Many publishers and curriculum providers are going to provide this information online or in the actual text. It's important to note that even many school systems don't finish the entire book or class. That happens often. Yeah. More than you know. Right. We usually <laughs> recommend that your student completes at least 75 or 80 percent of the assignments in a textbook to earn the credit. Yeah. And for courses that don't follow a set curriculum, you can determine credit by keeping track of the reasonable time that your student spends on the coursework. So for a core course like English, science, history, math, or foreign language, you want your teen to log at least 150 hours for one credit. And that's roughly about five hours a week for 30 weeks. Right. Uh, logging more than 150 hours does not earn them more credit. It just simply indicates that like that threshold of 150 has been passed. Right. And 
And for honors courses and advanced placement or AP courses, students may log far more than the 150 hours. Generally, honors courses require 8 to 10 hours per week per 30 plus weeks, and AP courses require 10 to 15 hours per week for 30 plus weeks. Even though honors and AP courses demand more hours than a standard high school course, they don't earn more credit when students spend more than 150 hours completing them. Instead, there may be GPA rewards to take these more challenging courses. For instance, we award an extra half point for honors courses and an extra one point for an AP or a dual credit course on our transcript. Yep. And for a lab science course, you want to log a minimum of 180 hours, and that additional 30 hours is lab work, um, and it's required for lab work. One college we applied to actually required an addendum for homeschool, private, and charter school students to determine that their high school lab sciences were legit. Yeah. <laughs> For an elective course like PE, art, music, or another course that is not a core academic course, you would log 120 plus hours for one credit and 60 plus hours for a half a credit. If you have a student who is a musician, for example, like Thank mine, you. <laughs> <laughs> you can consider all their lessons, practice time, performance as a credit. Open mic nights totally do count. We're doing one tonight. Mm -hmm. Yay. Go Cameron. <laughs> And so does writing your theme song for your mom's podcast. Oh, yeah. totally. Go Cameron. <laughs> yeah, credit is due. So yeah. love our jingle. Exactly. I do too. It's very catchy. My kids are competitive athletes, so I gave them PE credit every year because they definitely put in the training and competition time. Um, I don't actually track or document this in any other way. I don't either. <laughs> uh, consider it your bingo freebie square if you're in a similar position. I don't know that any <laughs> college is ever going to ask, like, could we get the breakdown <laughs> of your uh, PE credits, please? Right. <laughs> If your teen completes a three to five credit college course in one college session, whether it be an eight week and an 11 week or a 16 week semester, we recommend converting this course to a one credit high school course on your high school transcript. That's kind of like a little trick that a lot of people do with dual credit is that even if you take a little tiny three week semester in the winter, you will get an entire year of credit for that class in high school. So that's super cool. So even with those abbreviated classes, the amount of coursework is often the same as if this was a semester or a year long class. I know we talk about that, but really, I don't think it's quite the work. I think that three week course, there's no way that they can cover an entire Well, thing. I don't know. My kids three week calculus course was like nine hours of math a day. Like, it was a lot. But they did it. <laughs> they did it. But that's why I do a subject transcript, though. Uh, like, my kids loved those mini semester classes. It, they can kind of look weird on a yearly transcript when you have, like, a bunch of them. Yeah. But they loved it. You know, they could see the light at the end of the tunnel. They uh, were more, they were fine putting in that amount of work for those classes. Right. I like to do a subject transcript also because sometimes I'll load up one year or one semester and then I kind of give them the semester off or, you yeah. know, do one or two classes. So exactly. Like, it yeah, spreads it out. Sometimes yeah done two sciences in one year and so <laughs> then not one for the next year so yeah right. it's uh, we'll talk more about that when we cover transcripts right also consider that not everything needs to be a class I see that a lot on message boards where people are like oh my kid spends x amount of time a week doing this like how do I make that a class like you do also want to have some great extracurriculars included in your records it makes your students look more well-rounded and interesting so right. uh, don't like not everything has to be like my kid uh feeds the dog every day and walks them. Can I make that like an animal science pet sitting elected? Like you don't need to do that. Like don't. Right. Yeah, yeah. You you don't want to just add classes for the sake of filling up your transcript. Exactly. It can really delegitimize the rest of your transcript. We already work so hard to give our kids varied classes and learning opportunities with other teachers and avoid the appearance of just the mom grades. So we don't want to add a bunch of nonsense filler just for the sake of filling up space and saving time. Yeah, we're all about multitasking, but like be smart about it. Right. <laughs> Woo, so that's a lot of information for classes for high school. I'm, I'm loving this high school series. I am too. I'm so excited to hit on that conference and just kind of share everything by then. It'll be June. So we should be about halfway through our series. Oh my God. 
Already. Wow. Right. <laughs> now the guide, the high school guide probably won't be ready by then, like I talked about, but hopefully we'll have a lot of freebies before then. I'm going to package everything up for everybody. So it will be super helpful for a lot of people looking to homeschool high school. It is going to be awesome. So meanwhile, tune in next week for episode 20. Uh, we're going to do a top 10 list. I love top 10 lists. <laughs> um, it's 10 things I wish I knew about homeschooling. Like what was a waste of time? What should I have spent more time on? And what is the biggest lesson I've learned? It's going to be a great episode. Oh, yeah. I've learned a lot of lessons. I'm excited to share all that because, you know, you don't want people to always make the same mistakes. Yeah, that learn you from made. learn from our mistakes. Right. Do as we say, not as we do. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We'll see you next time. See you next time. Bye bye. <laughs> Cheers. Be sure to check us out on our website at btdthomeschool.com as in been there, done that, btdthomeschool.com. You can join our mailing list and get news and updates on future podcasts. And be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, at the BTDT Been There, Done That Homeschool Podcast.